welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will talk about global reforestation with our special guests, Matt Hill, President and Founder of, and Chief Environmental Officer of One Tree Planted, and Brees Robertson, Director of Impact Assessment and Monitoring of the same organization, One Tree Planted. And we're so appreciative of your work and the fact that you're here to share that with us today. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah, excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, Matt, I looked it up. 15 billion trees are annually cut down and 5 billion trees are planted. It's not the same thing, right? Those that are, the trees that are planted um, are very often planted in rows. That reforestation takes uh, decades uh, to actually occur. Um, and so we're losing a huge amount of habitat. We're using a huge amount of, of wood to fires and, and uh, to, to other environmental uh, disasters like drought and, and so on through the global uh, climate change that is taking place. Do you feel sometimes, um, particularly as the founder, that um, you are fighting against the tide? And, and how do you sustain yourself as you look at what's happening today uh, on the earth. I just try and make it inspiring because I don't want everybody to feel like they can't do anything. I try and make it inspiring. And somebody wants to plant a tree and see the importance and the impact. It's better than doing nothing, saying this is too big of a problem. You know, I feel a lot of organizations, it was doom and gloom. I think people are desensitized now to all the negative news that's out there. We just tried to reposition it and show these amazing projects that are doing incredible work. And, you know, together we can make a positive impact. Is is part of what you're doing to try and change um, the hearts and minds of us all to really think not only about planting a tree, but also about sort of infecting others with this idea that trees preserving wildlife, preserving habitat uh, is really important to us personally. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, we talk, I talk about the six pillars, air quality, water quality, water quality, biodiversity, cleaning the air, uh, sequestering carbon. There's a lot of things that resonate different with other people. So, you know, I start from the, the basics, bringing people out to do tree planting events in their local community, get their hands in the dirt, and then they yeah. you know hear about how that work that's local is making an impact. And then they're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I want to do more. And then they'll start learning more and more things that you can do that's just going to help. That's beyond just tree planting. There's a lot of different things you can do. So let's let's talk about the impact that you have. But uh, before we go there, Matt, could you give us a description of the organization as a whole and, and how it evolved from your founding? Sure. I started it in 2014 as a 501c3 based out of Vermont. It was just me, myself, and I kind of had to figure out the lay of the land and how this works. I'm not a forester. I don't have a specialty in here. I come more from the marketing background. And then, you know, met with Cal Fire, you know, met with the United States Forest Service, watersheds, just absorbed as much information as I could. Move it now to today. And we're a team of, you know, over 80 people on the team. We plant in five regions around the world, North America, South America, Asia, Africa, and now into Europe. Um, and just continuing to grow. And a big important part where, you know, love to for Brees to, to chime in here, uh, 2023 is really on the monitoring because I think that people were reluctant to kind of give to organizations or plant a tree. How do I know my tree was planted? How do I know it survived? So we're investing a lot into the technology aspect in, in 2023 with Breeze coming on board to really show people that this is making an impact and working. So when you start off in, in uh, looking at, uh, at planting trees, you don't have to measure impact because you're just trying to plant. But as these trees mature, Brees, you have to understand of how these environments hang together and how the planted environments can evolve into a more wild environment. Uh, talk a little bit about your coming on now to Want to Be Planted and, and the role that you have in connecting the dots between what is what might have been done uh, uh, 10 years ago and what's going on now. Yeah, well, I'm so excited to be a part of this organization. You know, the the impact that we're having all across the world with our planting partners and for communities and ecosystems is really, 
you know, expanding and accelerating. So to your point about more trees are being cut down than being planted, you know, I think we're going to see a shift there um, here in the, in the near future, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, we're planting all these trees. How do we know this reforestation and restoration is working around the country? And so that's really what I am doing with the organization and with our partners is understanding, you know, what information do we already have? And that comes in a bunch of different, um, it comes to us in a bunch of different ways. You know, some, a lot of our planting partners will send us information about the trees that they planted, um, geotag photographs, drone imagery. Um, they send us an actual um, map polygon of where the planting was a, has occurred. And, you know, we can use that information to see, you know, where the trees are, how many trees were planted. Um, but as time goes on, you know, these trees, when they're planted, they can be a couple inches or they could be six inches, but they're not very big. Um, but it's, as time goes on and they grow, uh, we can use technology to actually track the progress of the growth of the trees and then also um, the multi-benefits, the co-benefits that these, these forests bring to communities, um, you know, whether that's agroforestry or new food sources for the community, whether it's protecting or creating habitat that had been degraded for wildlife and species. Um, to Matt's point about climate change, you know, we're planting mangroves that are helping coastal communities be resilient against some of these bigger um, hurricanes and other other typhoons and things that we're seeing all around the, the country and the world. So we're using, you know, a mix of, I'd call it self-reported data with our partners and technology to monitor and um, tell the stories of the impacts of these reforestation projects all over the world. Talk about the range of different types of projects that you have in these different countries, Matt. Um, give, us, give us a sense of, of the kinds of uh, resources you bring together and the kinds of plots that you're planting. So let's take the United States. So, you know, let's, we're planting at the federal level. We're one of the official partners with the United States Forest Service. So we can plant, you know, like Yosemite National Forest, Chippewa National Forest. Then we work at the state level. So we work a lot with, you know, with the different resource conservation districts, CAL FIRE, Florida State Forestry, and then we work down at the watershed level and like land trusts. So from 2000 tree type projects all the way up to the million types of tree projects, a lot of different stakeholders trying to get everybody to kind of be on the same page, making sure that these are successful projects, right? Quality projects, not just trying to throw in a big number and just say, okay, we planted X amount of trees. It's really about doing it the right way. And then when you go into other projects in South America or planting in Brazil or Peru, we're over in Africa and Kenya, Australia with the bushfires. Again, the different types of organizations that really need that funding, um, you know, that cover the cost of the tree. You know, one of the biggest questions that comes up is how do you plant a tree for a dollar? And it's difficult. It's hard to do it at a dollar. And most of the time it's co-blended financing. So when we receive a dollar from a donor, we really want to make sure that that dollar is being used efficiently and being used the right way and not getting caught up in, in, in limbo or administrative costs. So, you know, there's four key costs that I look at, the site prep, what's the cost in the prep that, what's the cost to grow the tree, what's the cost to put the tree in the ground, and what are your monitoring and maintenance costs. And often one tree planted, you know, amount that we send to that partner on the ground is going for them to purchase those trees from a local nursery and to pay the tree planters to go out. That organization on the ground has their funding in and all, so most of the time when we provide that funding, they'll get a match grant from the government municipality. And I feel that that's more successful because you have different people that have a vested interest to make sure that these projects, you know, happen, work. Yeah. So all, all ranges and types of projects. So you're, you're, you're taking the life cycle cost uh, approach or a quasi life cycle approach in which you're looking at the few, at the current cost to actually put that tree in the ground, but also the future costs as that tree grows. Is that correct? Well, it's important in Brees's, uh, you know, aspect to it is you, you don't want to just give them the money and just that year we're looking at multi-year 
you know, commitments with these partners on the ground. They have to hire the staff and the people, and sometimes they need to increase their nursery capacities. You mentioned something about seed collection. You know, that's a point I think a lot of people are overlooking. So providing, you know, resources beyond just costs from the one tree planted size. We're equipping our partners on the ground with drones so that they can fly it and get back the data here. Um, better methodologies that, you know, the British Columbia Ministry of Forestry might be using, saying, have you thought of this or that? But, you know, how do we make this more sustainable? How can we scale the programs? And again, you know, Breeze having the ability to work closely with all the partners around the world and just hearing from them, you know, what they need so that this is all working for everybody. Breeze, are you finding that this uh, these technologies like Zoom and so on, and the fact that you can move data back and forth, is that is that the thing that is enabling your function now within the organization? Because you obviously can't get onto planes, trains, and automobiles to actually do site visits. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, we do a lot of site visits. Um, we have great relationships with our planting partners, and, and that's really important, you know, to, to build those relationships. And, you know, we really want to build the capacity of our planting partners. So, as Matt mentioned, you know, if a partner doesn't have a cell phone, for example, that can take a geotag photo or they don't have a drone, you know, which most of them don't, we actually do send people out to meet with them. Matt's going to India tomorrow to, to do a site visit and Ross, my colleague, will be there with his drone um, and we're going to have drones to, to share with our planting partners there and teach them how to use them. And to your point, you know, use the cloud and technology to get that data back into our hands so that then we can use things like artificial intelligence and object detection on some of those images to see the trees, see how they're growing and calculate the impacts of those projects. Could you describe a little bit about the life cycle of the forest and how what trees you start off planting? Because if you've had a forested area and you're trying to recover that forest, you can't just plant the same species that would be a mature uh, that that would exist in a, in a mature forest. You actually have to think about what would bind together the soil first, and then you go through those next stages to try and bring that that area back. Um, how do you select what trees are being planted in the different regions in the United States and the different regions across the world? How do you know what to plant, and and how do you determine um, your approach to create a to creating ultimately a recovered forest. Do you want to take this one recently? <laughs> yeah, I, I can start. Um, so again, it comes back to our relationships with our planting partners. They're the ones that are there. They're on the ground. They know the indigenous species that have been in that area for a long time. They have a lot of insights into invasives that could come in and really crowd out, you know, what needs to be uh, planted there. Um, and so we really rely on them and they uh, provide a proposal, you know, before every project. And we go through a, a pretty rigorous process of vetting those proposals, looking at the types of trees that they're going to plant. Um, and then we, you know, we have some back and forth with them. Um, but they're really the experts, you know. But we do have forestry specialists on staff that take a look at these reports and then we can determine what species need to be planted. But it's it's often a pretty big mix of species, to your point, that we plant in these locations. And Brees, does it, it, does it happen um, where people are coming to you with a proposal first? Are they basically coming to you as if they're they're soliciting your participation um, and, and your coordination, your uh, scientific knowledge um, as, as, as they have identified some place in their local community where they'd like to have uh, trees planted? Yep, they come to us. Um, and again, we have this proposal process. You know, we can really bring the funds and the support and the capacity building to our partners so that we can make these projects happen. How did you go, uh, Matt, from uh, founding this in 2014 to having such a large footprint? That it seems to me that there's a lot of marketing skill that that takes place, and there's the the implementation and project management skill. You don't have a big a group of people, and and you were uh, an individual who, who founded this. What is your background? How did you end up acquiring those skills and then building a team that embedded those skills? to get the word out and then to manage these projects. 
Sure. A great question. So I was a marketing professor before I started this. So I knew a lot of the tricks in terms of the analytics and the Google searches and create a pretty website and get traffic to the website. Um, so that was one part. And then I felt that there was some voids. I felt that a lot of the organizations were staying complacent, a lot of doom and gloom. And then if you donated to uh, the charity, you're in the dark on how was my dollar donation, you know, being used. So I wanted to bring the donor along for a journey um, and be more inspiring. So thanks for your $10 or thanks for planting 10 trees with us in Brazil. And then a week later is here's the area in terms of where we're planting. And these are the types of tree species. And then we're growing your tree now. And hey, it's the it's the rainy season. We're out planting your tree. So I really worked a lot on the email that was what we call a drip flow to them. So they just felt that they're part. And if they saw the updates, that they would continue to, you know, donate or be involved. And we never really positioned ourselves as give us money. It was more inspiring, more hope. And like, check out this amazing project that's doing this incredible work versus, hey, can you donate $20 before the hour's over, you know, and we'll triple your donation. We never do that. So storytellers, and then I said we'd create it through video, so a lot of videos, so I would go out into the field and do that, and then, you know, a lot of great pictures and maps, so I think we grew that, and then there was two parts, I said, one, build the brand, if you think of a tree planting organization, most, the average person couldn't really think of, of any, so I wanted to build the brand and corporate culture, you know, I have an incredible team here, you know, Breeze, Breeze coming on board, just they really know their stuff. They're so passionate. We want to build something amazing here and bring restoration to the next level. And as a charity, you know, being in this charitable space, another part to me was, you know, I gave $10, but, you know, $6 went to the cause and $4 was held up in administrative costs. It was a big thing for me to maintain that 80-20 rule. So we do a lot of great work getting the dollar straight to the ground and bypassing middlemen making sure those are being used, but we really work at the 80-20 rule. And I think last year we finished off at 83 cents went to the ground and 17 cents of every dollar was to cover our administrative. But that's to cover the technology, the travel to the sites. And, you know, people say, well, you're traveling to a site and, you know, there's a footprint getting there. But, you know, we really want to make sure that these partners on the ground, we can work with them closely, makes a big difference by being there, looking at their nurseries, visiting the sites firsthand, where are their pain points for you? How can we help more? It's just not a transactional aspect to us. This is about strong partnerships and how we can scale with them. Uh, it's an important topic right now, top of mind for a lot. People feel paralyzed that they can't do enough, but you know, collectively this all adds up and we're making some pretty great progress right now and so much more to be done. You know, this, this uh, combination of, of starting off with some skills in marketing and communication, Right. And the whole idea of engaging people, basically, because of your background, you analyze the problem in a way that other people perhaps hadn't analyzed it. It's really about people involvement and about people engagement, that sort of back and forth. And, and you start off with that and then you build a business based in that interaction. It's just as important as putting a tree in the ground, the interaction and the, the individual involvement. Right, Reese? It is. Yeah. And, you know, the you know, Matt talked about storytelling, video, and, you know, now we're really mo moving into storytelling with data, data-driven storytelling. And people really want that. You know, they want to know not only did was their tree planted, but in three years, you know, how did, how's that forest thriving? Or, you know, our planting partners want to know, like, well, what kind of data do we need to do adaptive management if we need to for invasive invasive species species or wildfires or things like that. So it's really all about being transparent, um, being accountable and, and really bringing our donors along with us through this journey. And Matt, I guess I guess you as a marketing professional, you know that people um, are different people are, are um, more sensitive to different types of messages. Some people are data focused, some people are emotionally focused. some people want to just feel good about, making a contribution. So basically you're shaping messages and your work Reese, is, an, is an extension of that more into the scientific and data uh, piece so that you can connect with these different types of information consumers. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're, you're selling trees, but you're also selling an information product, aren't you? 
Mm. I joke a lot and I say we happen to be a marketing company that plants trees, right? And I say that jokingly. I mean, like we said, I think we have like almost 30 people that are project managers and a lot of them have their, like Ross, who's coming to India with me, his master's in forestry from Yale, you know, and, and you know, our chief operating officer worked at the Nature Conservancy and has his master's in soil quality. So a lot of experts in this team and it's a holistic approach in terms of making sure, yeah, quality projects, working with a partner, but yeah. I think, like Brees mentioned, transparency is so important where, you know, companies back in the day were writing X amount, sending it there, but in the dark for two years and they get a 40 page report. I always said, keep it simple. You know, people will get there. If they want that extra layer of information, they can and be on a deep call. If they want to be on a Zoom call and be directly with the partner on the ground. And when I go to India, we have some donors that are coming with us to see the sites and meet the partners on the ground firsthand, visit the nurseries. And then even expanding into nurseries now where we're building them in, in India, where the trees that we're growing are being more acclimatized. So we're going to have better tree survivability. And you asked that question. We rely on those partners. They're the experts on the ground and know what's going on locally and are making the best decision. We just want to listen to them and, yes, vet, vet it, ask them questions, but making sure that we're just not handing away money and hoping for the best. We really, I think, have a tight program tracking every dollar to every tree in the back end from the technology aspect. So when a donor wants to know like at what stage is my dollar at, we can pull it up in seconds. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add a quick thing, Mark, you know, the um, corporations and companies are more and more creating these sustainability goals and, co and countries, you know, like everybody's having to create these sustainability goals. And we work with a lot of those companies and, and governments and, and they require transparency and accountability. So that's really, you know, where the data comes into play. You know, it, it's really bringing those, those things together around storytelling and traditional methods through video and narrative and bringing in the data as well. So that the companies and governments that we work with can show that they are meeting their goals and making a big impact towards our climate goals. You're also giving different people a way to participate, right? You give individuals a way to participate. You give people in the G7, the G20, uh, from the wealthier countries a way to participate. You give people from uh, poor areas a way to participate, businesses and so on, governments, uh, local and, and federal uh, centralized uh, governments. So you're basically ensuring that everybody has something that they can productively do. It, it, it is, in many respects, a way to create a collaboration mm -hmm. uh, without uh, necessarily uh, being too uh, upfront about it, sort of naturally by, by people being able to find their own level, right? All of a sudden, they find themselves in unusual collaborations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like urban to rural, you know, cities to wilderness areas. We're working across all of those different types of geographies. So it's so very important to bring us together, right? Because we, we have these sort of fake differences that, that we can uh, attack through these kinds of, of uh, important and beneficial projects. I have a question for you about your business skills and using your business skills for a social good. Uh, activity. Sometimes I hear people talk about the fact that if you're doing something like planting trees, you're basically being funded by um, by government through taxes and through economic activity, uh, meaning uh, business activity, profit making activity, and you're a nonprofit. Um, so there is this sense that in some, in, you have people who create wealth. And then that wealth is spent. Do you feel that you are spending the wealth that others create, or are you creating wealth yourself through your activities? I would go wealth through ourselves, through our activities. I mean, we're just, it's so important what we're doing. How do you, how do you create wealth through your activities, uh, Matt? Well, I mean, I mean, for myself, it's just personally like gratifying in terms of what I'm doing. I wake up every day. I love what I do. So, you know, where I, somebody who has that wealth and wants to do something good for the environment, you know, and help with local biodiversity, create the jobs, right? I think that they're wanting to see that. I think people were reluctant in the past because the technology wasn't there and they gave that and they were in the dark to know, is this really making a difference? And now when you can see this is making a difference. So anyways, for myself personally, you know, 
Um, I love what I'm doing. And I think I have these calls with these people who have been very successful and are doing this not because it's a tax receipt. It's because it's the right thing to do. And they feel you know, positive from doing this and will continue to do more. And you're seeing this from a lot of wealthy people that are out there in the news that, you know, we need to do more for the environment. And they're doing it because it gives them a, a sense of, of, of support and help. And I would just add, like, the ecosystem services that our reforestation projects bring to the world, you know, local communities, but also that, you know, we're bringing to the world are huge, you know, and we can talk about wealth um, in relationship to the dollar. But when we really start thinking about the ecosystem services that these forest um, projects provide, it's huge, you know, it's it's um, helping reduce um, health impacts in communities and insurance costs. You know, th there's just the benefits go on and on. Mm -hmm. and I personally am really excited that a lot of these trees that we're planting today are going to be alive well beyond when I am not here on this earth. And it just makes me feel so good to know that those trees are going to be here providing oxygen and all of those benefits for the planet when I'm not here anymore. <laughs> I think we I think we can all do a little bit of a better job, um, Matt. I'm making reference to your background in marketing of communicating the economic benefits of, of reforestation of planting trees, because there are so many economic benefits. Uh, Brees, you mentioned the whole idea of uh, filtering water, for example, and retaining water in forested areas. And goodness knows we have droughts. We need to replenish our groundwater, and, and forested areas are the uh, are part of the start of, uh, of, uh, of that. So you do a lot of marketing uh, for One Tree uh, Planted, uh, Matt, and, uh, and Brees, um, you, you engage a lot of different types of people. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the scope of those efforts. Who, who gets involved? So, you know, we work with a lot of amazing brands. So, you know, for Volvo and they have their recharge electric car, if you come in and do a test drive, it'll plant five trees. We work with Dunkin' Donuts, where if you come in to Dunkin' Donuts and if they're 9,000 stores, it'll help uh, plant a tree where they source their, their coffee from. And one area that we're really pushing is the sports industry, because I feel the sports industry has such massive amounts of fans. For example, we work with the New England Patriots and they wanted to plant in the six states that they represent and each of the different states. One was a watershed and one was an agroforestry project and one was just like, you know, helping create jobs for, with Major League Soccer for every goal scored, we'll plant 100 trees where those teams play. So doing a lot in the sports industry, trying to bring awareness and then collectively get the fans involved. Um, Major League Baseball during the home run derby, for every home run, it was planting 100 trees. So again, it's continuing to grow and I think has massive amounts. Like So first you get the players, then you get the teams. And then if you get enough of the teams, you get the leagues. And imagine if the NFL said, you know, plant the tree in the NFL forest. You know, how many people would love to just go and see what's happening and learn more about the impact? And they have the power, the voice, the reach. So part of this is is just getting people with voice to join to have their to join their voices to yours, right? Exactly, and probably one of the biggest ones right now that's recognizable is Coldplay. You know, one of the biggest bands in the world, and you know, for every ticket sold when they're on tour, plants a tree with us, and when they start their concert, they have a thirty second video that says they're helping the planet and reforesting. And they show the different countries that they're supporting. And then the fans can go to their page to learn about how Coldplay is committed to doing more for the environment. Well, thank you so much for sharing your work. I'm Matt Hill, President, Founder and Chief Environmental Officer of One Tree Planted and Brees Robertson, Director of Impact Assessment Monitoring of One Tree Planted. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. And please, please, please see if you can um, uh, help us to help our forests. Thank you. Thank you.